Super, also ähm, ich heiße Michael Schlofen Benewitz, wie es da drauf steht. Ich habe überlegt, diese, diesen Vortrag auf Englisch zu halten, aber was denkt ihr? Das Ding ist, dass es wird aufgenommen, dann verstrahlt über andere, den Welt. In Vergangenheit hab, haben, oh, das fällt gleich runter. Ja, also bleiben wir auf Deutsch. <lacht> Okay, actually, I think I will change to English since there is no complaints and it seems we're all okay with English because of the uh, the video uh, recording nature of this. And so there's actually quite a lot more people that hear this after the fact, after we're finished here. Um, English is kind of a crappy language compared to Putonghua, Deutsch and everything else, but um, entering battery save mode. Huh? Okay, right. So anyway, um, let's do this in English this year. Um, right, so the name is actually building the first Monero hardware wallet. We may be, we may be uh, examining a bit of generic, a bit of generic, um, let me see if I can reach the very end here, a bit of generic uh, in information about microcontrollers and how to make firmware and so on. But I've intentionally decided to keep this very simple and we'll do a graphic storytelling based little adventuresome type of thing. Image rich storytelling, because I think it's Saturday, it's the end of the day. So you've all deserved a well deserved break from, um, from mathematics and theory, I think. And the other thing I'd like to mention, this is very hardware oriented. Don't start leaving the room yet. It's, <laughs> it's jumping over chairs. This is hardware hardware only. So we won't be talking about blockchains, mining, everything that's very relevant to Monero. I'm just talking about the hardware in here. Um, the one thing I'd like to start with is a little camera action here. So uh, we, were, we were providing these to DEF CON just a couple weeks ago. Um, I'll show you how that looks here. That's the badge. And you turn it on, it does that. You can push the button, it changes to a different animation. And I have a few of these to give out. At the end of the lecture, the presentation, I will ask a few questions. And if you're a lucky person that has also paid attention, then you might get the right answer and you can take one of these badges home free of charge. I also have some uh, to sell at half price because this is a student event. Anyway, so those are the badges that the hardware team has made for DEF CON and they seem to be a very hot number. A lot of anticipation of people wanting those. We'll do that at the end. I do have as well some uh, business cards. I will leave them up here. Monero is a very privacy oriented uh, system. So some people like to ask questions in private. You can do that by taking a business card before you leave. And let's get started then because like we're a bit too late. So th the, next, uh, the next slides, all of these things here, schematics and photographs and graphical, all, everything's of graphical nature and more, um, I've just taken from the uh, project management website. That's up here, it's kind of hard to read, but it's, uh, it's called taiga.getmonero.org. And that's where we keep our notes and uh, there's team members here. We have a team of about 42 people. 42 is a magic number, I think, in computer science, yeah. Uh, so we have Milos, for example, who has done some uh, create simple enclosures. As you can imagine, he's a mechanical engineer doing enclosure work. The enclosures, the Gehäuse for the, for the, uh, uh, for the Platine, uh, how do you say that in English, for the, uh, for the PCBs. And there's a lot of other information here. If you ever get interested in knowing more about the project, our Taiga page is the place to go. And that's where you find a lot of these things. So this is the schematic for the, the hardware that we're producing, the hardware wallet. I'm gonna start by just passing out a, one of these hardware wallets so we kind of understand what we're talking about when we talk about building the first Monero hardware wallet which is the name of this presentation. Uh, bags within bags, shouldn't have done that. All right, so I'll just show this quickly to, ex to maybe visually explain. This is the latest generation of our hardware wallet. 
there we go. If I put it sideways, then it's, and it does have a, a screen there. It's just kind of flopping around. <laughs> you gotta glue that down. Um, and this is the hardware wallet that will go in a uh, enclosure and then at some point in time be available for consumers to use with their Monero uh, wallets. Um, so I'm gonna send that out. There are some other generations here. I have a few things to pass out and show off. I'll, I'll, show, I'll show this, uh, I'll pass this one out as well. You just have to make sure to pass that to the next person as well. Where are the speakers? <laughs> So um, I'll pass this and that from this side, and then we'll go from the other direction with that there. And those are wallets, those are hardware wallets. And that's what we're talking about today. So this is the schematic. Now I don't expect there to be many hardware engineers here and developers, but the way you begin any project, whether it's a IVI a dashboard for a car or anything that, that contains uh, PCBs and hardware, you need to start with a, it's typical to start with a schematic. So you have uh, all of these chips. Here is a, here is for example, one of the, the largest chips, and so it's also the largest representation, this very large yellow piece, that's the microcontroller. Then we have a display here, that's an OLED and organic, whatever OLED stands for. Here is a, a connector, that's a, a USB connector. And then there's a lot of connections or, or resistors, and, and here are some capacitors, a capacitor array. This is a schematic for exactly the device that is passing around the room right now. Uh, and well, there's other things on there. Um, what follows the schematics design is the layout design. So a typical hardware engineer will finish the schematics or mostly finish the schematics and then start uh, populating a PCB. The outline is here, you can see the yellow. In fact, if you compare that to the uh, PCB uh, going the rounds, it's about the same with a notch up here. And if you look carefully, there's a lot of parts that are not on the PCB yet. Um, this is kind of a, a work in progress. I wanted to show what a layout engineer does as he's populating uh, the PCB. He has a lot of resistors, a lot of capacitors, and he has to find a place, she has to find a place for them on the, uh, on the actual substrate, this green piece of, well, it's called substrate. Um, and then down here, I believe these are switches or I'm not real sure what they are, but well, there are, another, there are other parts. Um, most of these things are resistors and capacitors. Um, and I think I can show quickly, uh, I'm using KiCad for all of this. So basically what we would do, start a new project. Um, here's the name break, Breakneck. This is the, the most recent, uh, and it's no surprise that this is very similar to what we were just looking at. There are a few more things that I added after the fact. I think these are secure elements. And here is a SDHC reader, which you see no connections at all. So that tells you something. I, ha I either haven't connected it or it's just an afterthought or an experiment that may ne never uh, be actually uh, implemented or created. Right, and then the next step you would do in Designing hardware, there's Bautile Editor PCB New, so I'm just going to click on there. In this KiCad program, I'm gonna click on the Layout Editor, and that will bring up exactly what we saw in the other picture. We can zoom in as well. Oops. We can, there we go, zoom in as well. I can remove the fill layer, put it back in the planes, the ground planes, and so on. This is kind of the basis of hardware engineering. So let's go back to the slide set. There it is here. Here's a slide set. And we can keep going. Right, um, this is kind of a composite rendering. Um, what, what, which has, both sides of the PCB, and I've put some graphics on there. Um, and basically, after you're mostly finished, uh, what you can do with KiCad and probably any of the other editors is, this is easy to show with 
the actual KiCad program, Ansicht and 3D Betrachter, and, and here we should have something we can zoom in on with, and then we can rotate this. This is this is a generated view, a 3D representation of what your board, your device might look like after you populate it. So there's a battery uh, holder on the back there. And there's a number of parts that, that you won't find in the, in the part in the device being passed around now, because I, as you can imagine, if I had soldered these on and I'm keeping this in my back pocket or, or in my suitcase, it's going to puncture the suitcase at some point. So that's the reason I didn't solder it on the real device. But a lot of these things are either optional or they don't exist yet, like the SDHC reader. You can see the largest part in the middle there. That's a, um, an MCU microcontroller. And then we have um, several special special features. For example, we have a capacitive touch sensor here, which acts like a button. You just uh, lay your finger on there and uh, it lights up from underneath. So we have an LED that's a reverse LED, um, which shines from the bottom. There's other LEDs over here like this one. A typical LED, it's a light emitting diode. It emits light in one direction, and this one emits light in the reverse direction. Anyway, so there, there are some uh, special features like that that you might not find in other devices. We're able to run off of USB 5 volt. This is a USB-C connector, and we're able to run off of a 3.7 volt uh, lithium polymer or other similar battery. So we have a, a, a JP, J, what are they called? I think JP connector here for that. On the bottom, there's a battery terminal, but after testing with that, I found it didn't work too well. I believe that this MCU, this microcontroller is too energy. Um, it, it just does, doesn't work with the low current of a battery. Right, so this is kind of the explanation or the demonstration of 3D, uh, emulation, how uh, a populated PCB might look once you're done with that. It's very useful so that you're not ordering, ordering fabrication of something that doesn't work in the end. Okay, that was the 3D demonstration. Now this one, unfortunately, doesn't rotate unless we go to the, uh, where is it now? Ah, I know where it is. It's here. So I stitched together the frames of a 3D rendering as it rotated. And this is kind of the what we get with that. No big deal. Um, we can move on, I suppose. So other team members that you may have seen on the Taiga project, there's a whole block there for team. We have 42 team members. Others have created things like um, a port of Ledger Blue. Um, and this is an example of that. It's a completely different wallet, uh, obviously. And the, the reason this could work with Monero is because we would write the firmware for it running on the MCU. So part of our research involves uh, discovering or, or studying the work done by others in an open source context. So any group doing uh, free and open source hardware design, even groups that are not so much open source like Ledger, but still release some of their schematics, um, we can kind of integrate that into our knowledge uh, by studying their designs and sometimes porting them uh, to our KiCad um, workflow. Uh, so once we have uh, a board designed, after all of the parts are in place, the, the capacitors, the resistors, and the MCU and connectors and everything, um, the next step is to uh, order real PCBs, printed circuit boards, from a contract fabricator. Um, people can, we can make circuit boards on our own in laboratories or even at a, at a local hacker space. But to get things like the, the green solder mask and, um, and, for example, fine pitch connectors, 0.5 or 0.65 millimeter pitch, it gets really difficult and very time consuming with a very high rate of errors. So it's very common to simply send out the designs to a contract manufacturer who then uh, produces the PCBs, probably three, five or 10 
pieces are the minimum. And then you get that in the mail two or three weeks later, right? So this is what we did with our first generation. I can see that it's the first generation because the crystal here is rather large and it has two through holes. So this is not our most, our, our newest um, hardware, uh, which is all S SMT or surface mounted technology. This has some holes for the parts. Um, anyway, so this is the first generation. We ordered three boards and they came in the mail. And you can see here as well, I'm too close to the screen. You can see that uh, there is a stencil as well. That's this steel plate here. And there are some holes in the steel plate. You may be able to see that there is a a round of holes here for the microcontroller. And what, what happens with a steel uh, with a steel foil or, or plate is uh, it's, it's called a stencil or, or a chablon um, in that you put this on top of the, uh, of the PCB and you, you squish, um, or how do you say it? You push a solder paste through all of those holes. And so obviously the solder paste is going only through the holes and lands on all of the pads and contacts in exactly the place where it should belong. That's what a stencil is for. That's what it does in, in our workflow, in our process, our PCB SMT process, surface mounted technology process. Um, once we've completed two or three or up to 10 of these uh, PCBs and we've uh, placed uh, solder uh, paste and parts and uh, reflowed the solder paste so that it's uh, so that it's connecting everything that means applying heat what we can think of doing is moving to a serial production um, uh, workflow which basically means using machines to do most of the work uh, this is a pick and place machine I don't know what its limits are but it, it can do a lot more than three or five uh, boards, we've used this to do several hundreds for some projects like the badge project. Um, so what it's basically doing is, is replacing the pick and place that a human with a human eye and a hand and a tweezers would do. Uh, many of the devices that we're working with have up to a hundred resistors, uh, capacitors, MCUs and parts like that. So if you can imagine once you get up to about 20 or 40 or 50 of those, it just, it's too time consuming. And that's when machines like PNP pick and place machines come into the picture. Unfortunately, in order to do that, we need a few other uh, changes in our workflow. The pick and place machines uh, operate much more efficiently um, with panelized designs. So when we have a single PCB here, that means with a MCU in the middle, microcontroller, a connector at the end, and so on, one screen, we don't want to just have run one uh, PCB through the machine and then take it off, look at it, or put the other one in. We want to do 12 at a time if possible. This is all about serial production. Um, the next step above serial production is mass production. There we're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions. Then the workflow changes again. But for the simple a few hundred at a time or so serial production method, we're trying to achieve um, this kind of a dozen at a time panelized uh, workflow works very well. Uh, this is an actual uh, readme type notes archive that I wrote for the for the um, contract fabricator that produced the PCBs. I wasn't sure if these edge um, if these edge well they're called mouse bites. I'm not sure if I write that in the notes. No, I don't. But um, these mouse bites separate the individual boards so that later you can easily break them apart with your fingers. Um, I'm going to pass out a, a example of this as well because it's actually quite neat. If we didn't have mouse bites here, we could use V, uh, v slots as well. Are they called? No, V cuts. And the difference between a mouse bite and a V cut is that, well, you're going to see it just by handling this, this piece here. And in fact, I can probably show it on the, on the camera. That's not the camera. Here's the camera. I can possibly show just a corner of this. All right, so here you can see the, the mouse bites. And the reason they're called mouse bites, there's all these little holes inside. It looks like a mouse bit into the PCB right there. And because there's holes there, you can break them apart, right? And then when you compare that to this, which doesn't have mouse bites, you can see that there are no spaces and no mouse bites. This is a V-cut uh, separation of the panel. 
And this works just as well, but because there's a V cut on the top and the bottom, it makes it easy to, to snap off there and to see the difference. Anyway, so I'll pass these out so you can get a feel for how panelization works. We'll do, uh, we'll do these at the same time. Yeah. Right, so that's basically what came back. In fact, I think one of those is exactly this um, order. I placed this order uh, this a few months ago, four or five months ago, and it's 12 boards at once. So you can see which one that is. All right, so why do we panelize? Um, I already told you that for these machines, they work more efficiently when they have one set of many boards all at once, or a panel is what they're called. Another reason is that if we are laying them out on a table for some, um, for some rework or some manual things like uh, a lot of through hole parts. I already showed you one, but here's another one like these battery contact terminals. These are not wallets, but these are the badges. And uh, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I'm, I'm um, manually soldering all of these uh, battery uh, terminals onto the board, and it just makes it a lot easier to have uh, a layout of, of panels instead of, you can imagine this is 50 uh, boards, so if I just had 50 boards laying on the table, each one would be at different angles, top and bottom. Uh, it would be very messy and difficult to work with. Question. Yes, so the question, was that a question? <laughs> Huh. Okay, so uh, the comment is, or the statement is that um, the, the project we're talking about, the Monero hardware wallet, is that it's open source hardware. And that's true, we use a, a, the CERN license for all of the hardware schematics, layouts, and then any web application or other documentation we use uh, equivalent or relevant uh, free and open source licenses. And then the qu question is, the next question is about this, the supply chain, right? People who are sourcing our parts, the MCUs and the fabricators that are providing us with the, um, with the PCBs if we trust them. Now, I don't understand the connection between open source and trusting a manufacturer. Do you want to... Chinese, I saw your email, uh, Seche Michael, it means uh, thank you. But uh, they can also produce later on the Monero wallet. Okay, I'm sorry. I could, yeah, I do understand the question now. And really the question is, and it doesn't involve the Icelandic, the Chinese, the Brazilians, or the, the, or the Irish, you know, whoever you provide the design to, to create these PCBs that you get in the mail, what if they uh, would start producing their own devices using your design? Because after all, it is open source. And I think, and the way I answer that, if, I, I think the question is, is this a concern, right? And if so, then how do you protect against copying. Um, it's not a concern for us because we wish for as many people to be producing a hardware as possible. Um, it could be a concern after we have a series of, um, of falsifications. Now, that's not copying. We want people to copy our, our designs, but falsifications could, could mean they're calling their device uh, the same thing that we were calling our device in the past. So then suddenly, like there's a, a green board and a red board, and one of them is called Monetsor, which is written on there. You can see that it's a Monetsor model. The other one is called a breakneck model. Now what if in Iceland, our manufacturer uh, takes our design, produces their own devices, but switches the names. So now suddenly our, our users are getting all confused and they're asking us for support for the poorly manufactured devices in Iceland, right? We haven't run into this problem yet, but I don't think we can have both. I don't think we can have an open and transparent workflow where we're providing our um, designs to all the world in an open source model and, uh, and completely protect against that the people who take our designs abuse it in some way. It's no different than people using OpenSSL in their uh, applications and then claiming that it's WolfSSL or something. They're just lying, but the WolfSSL folks, and they will receive support requests and see that, oh, it's all open, open SSL code, right? We don't, we don't have a different problem than they do. This is really has nothing to do with uh, Monero or with hardware. It's more generic.
Does that answer your question? Kind of a <laughs> half answer, I suppose. Right, so it makes it easier, panelization makes it easier to work manually on the devices. There are a number of advantages to this, which uh, answers the not yet asked question, these panels that we're handing around, um, why do we do that? Another good reason for that is packaging becomes easier, storage, if I'm sending this to a colleague who's going to color in uh, the, the silk screens or maybe assemble the batteries together or something else, it just is much easier to send a package of 10 or 20 panels instead of 100 individual individually wrapped boards, and then they have to unwrap them, and then there's just a lot of wasted time. So that's why panelization is good. Now here is the first Monisor panelization. I think um, this is a different design than the one that's being passed around, but it looks very similar. It's red, and it has a, a, the MCU in the middle, but I think you will find that the sides have Neither, well, it's different, isn't it? I mean, they don't have mouse bites. Um, they do have V cuts, but they, it looks different than the one passing, being passed around now. These are other de devices. These are not hardware wallets. They're called Sig Signets, I think, which is an open source uh, hardware de device. It's basically um, has some features of a YubiKey. It's a very interesting device. So I kind of, when we made packages, uh, holiday packages, for our testers, I included those. Here's a close-up of the um, of the Monitor, the first generation Monitor, which is a red board. It's a bit smaller. Uh, well, you can't tell from 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 this. It it still fits in your hand. It's a bit it's a bit bigger than than the finger, I suppose. Um, it's smaller and has less board space for less features. So you won't be able to find, for example, a battery terminal on this or an e-paper display on the bottom or all of these exotic things which uh, we pack onto the green boards, which are larger. We have two separate editions, the consumer edition, uh, and the developer edition. The developer edition has a lot of features which are untested, is a bit more risk involved there. And um, because for example, you use a battery on the developer edition and the battery voltage goes out, what does that mean for your data? You know, does it, at the end of the, the battery, um, does it generate a spike then or something if we did have a battery? Let's see if this works. I'm quite interested in seeing if the drawing on the screen works. Oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so if we have a battery uh, voltage, then typically we'll find that at the very end, it, go, it drops off almost immediately. And if we're lucky, that's exactly what happens. But if we're unlucky, then we get a spike here. That could happen as well. That could happen on the developer edition, but not on the consumer edition. On the consumer edition, we're trying to have all of the features well tested. So there's almost no chance of losing data. Um, the developer edition, it's another story, and that's what the green boards are with more board space and a lot of more, a lot more features. Um, I don't know why, ah, I do know why. So there's a difference between these two slides. It's a bit difficult to see. In this one, there are no parts. You don't see a black, uh, a black MCU there, or any connectors, or any, any USB things there. And the next one, and the switches as well, keep your eyes on that. So the next one, you see that there are switches, suddenly it's upside down, but you see your connectors are there as well. So this is when we start populating the PCBs. Um, that's what the pick and place machine does, or in this case, this was a uh, half year ago or so, so we were using tweezers. Um, this is one of the, the first um, phases of population. We're not populating any of the through-hole parts yet. We do that at the very end uh, for the simple reason that we're using a reflow oven in our SMT process, meaning that all of the parts that get uh, melted with the, uh, with the solder at first, um, they, they don't have any holes because we're sliding the PCBs into an oven. The oven heats the PCB and the solder uh, connects the parts with the substrate. If there were holes there, the solder would fall through, right? So the next step is to manually populate all of the through hole parts. And that's what we do here. We see, we see some of the uh, headers. Um, that's about the only thing. This other header we are not populating because it's meant for uh, JTAG programming, um, for flashing the, 
the microcontroller. And that's how a Monitor looks when it's finished. Um, this is still cut quite early in the development process, which is why there's no enclosure and why it doesn't look nice. Uh, once we do have a board finished, uh, we can we can refer to des the design and make some considerations. For example, what happened to us once is that the, the USB connector was not working properly. So we put that under a microscope and realized that some of the circuits that we had designed were incorrect. So we did some debugging and hacking here. We, we changed the resistor, which is normally straight, to be, to be at an angle here sideways. We shorted the two connectors there with a wire and um, we masked off parts of the USB-C connector. There's a big difference between USB-C USB-C is the latest um, standard. I think you all know that, right? There's a USB-A, USB-B, USB-B micro, and then we have USB-C. Um, USB-B and USB-B micro, the typical ones from a couple years ago, any phone like the one I have, oh, well, it's over there, um, has a, typically a USB-B micro uh, connector. They have four contacts, four connectors. Uh, you know, these things here, the contacts. They have one for voltage, five volts, one for ground, I think, and then there's a, a data plus and a data minus, and that's all. And if you, can, if you count these here, we have 24. <laughs> so USB-C is a lot more challenging to solder. And I think that's one of the problems we had. We were not, uh, we were not writing traces to the um, PCB in the correct manner, so we had to mask off half of them, which then meant that we could only put the cable, the USB-C cable, in one way. Usually you can reverse uh, the USB-C cable, and it's no problem because it simply uses the other contacts, but we didn't do a good job of that, so in debugging, we masked it off anyway. That's the reason this slide is here, because Folks that, are, that work on software and they debug using GDB or step through code and then make a quick change or maybe rearrange the lines or erase something, comment it out, and then suddenly after seven minutes you have a whole new uh, application, you've compiled and built it, and the bug is no longer there, so you're done. And there's no indication anywhere that there was ever a problem, right? <laughs> so hardware is a slightly different situation because there's always a two to three week cycle in between uh, the contract manufacturers are producing your boards and sending them to you, it makes no sense if you can um, debug it like this and get it done in five minutes. Quite, quite um, clear that there's two different worlds, software and hardware. So once we have all of the bugs ironed out of the process um, and our boards are working correctly, uh, we need to write the firmware, right? Before there is firmware on the microcontroller, which is this part here, nothing runs. It's similar to, to buying a USB uh, media, you know, basic uh, whatever you want to call these things. You buy that, it comes to you in the mail, you want to use it, but there's no, nothing on there. You have, to, you have to put the information on there. And so these MCUs, they have storage for, pro, it's called program storage for your programs to run. Um, in firmware, uh, but you buy them from the manufacturer, in this case ST Microelectronics, and you get a reel of them, maybe a thousand MCUs. These cost about four and a half to five euros, so it's expensive. Um, but once you get them from the manufacturers, they are empty. If you plugged this board in, although it's complete, every part is on there, the crystal, the switches, the resistors, the capacitors, and the display, which after you pl plug the display on there, you plug it in, it still will do, will do nothing um, because there's, no pro there's nothing to run on the microcontroller. You haven't programmed the firmware yet, right? So the next step in the process is to write firmware. Now, we did this on our own. It's not really a hardware engineer's job, but we had to test the boards some way. So we wanted to know that the USB data circuit was working, things like that. Um, and most recently, uh, the number one Android or smartphone based Monero application called Monerujo, the, um, the author of that, his name is uh, M2049er. <laughs> he doesn't like giving his real name out. Anyway, the developer uh, integrated our hardware 
or actually the other way around. He produced a new firmware application called Monerujo HW that would run on our hardware. So this means that the person usually writing code for software running on Android phones is now, in addition to that, writing uh, code for, for firmware that runs on our um, devices, on our hardware wallets. So it's a bit different, but this is what follows the uh, populating an assembly stage. We need to write the firmware, and this is real firmware describing the USB code. Obviously, there's more than that. Just wanted to show an example. Um, then we use some FOSS programming tools, the free and open source uh, software programming tools to program that firmware onto the CPU, or the MCU. Um, because obviously the question then becomes, well, there's nothing on the MCU. How do we put that code that I just showed onto the MCU? You need something like this. Uh, if you look at the bottom, it's very faint, but it says JTAG debugger. It's not so much about debugging what we're talking about now. We're talking about flashing or programming a firmware onto the chip, onto the MCU. And um, yeah, I don't have a video show, showing me doing this, but this is basically a device that allows us to do that. If we do go back a minute uh, and look at some of the interfaces, this interface here, the JTAG interface, this is what connects to that green box that I just showed. So we have the green box connected to the laptop or the computer over USB, and then the green box connected to this over a JTAG or any, basically any, any type of contact that has six contacts or five actually, it needs five I believe. So in this case, uh, we're providing power through here, but no data, and all of the flashing and program is going through the JTAG um, connector there. And that's what we use this for. Um, what we want to do, or we wanted to reach a stage in development where we didn't need to have JTAG programmers everywhere because we were sending these boards dozens out at a time to testers and we wanted some of those people to be writing firmware and they don't have the JTAG debuggers. Uh, it's very commonplace to plug your USB cable in and to simply flash and program over that. Um, it's and it's, it's, it's not real easy to do. You have to have different, uh, a different method of bootloading and so on. But we, we were able to do this in uh, mid-stage of production. So after we started assembling and having success with JTAG, this was the next thing that we did, the DFU. It's called Device Firmware Update, um, which is DFU, even if there's nothing to update, it's in the first case, as soon as you put a program for, on there for the first time, you can use DFU if you have a proper, um, uh, if, yeah, if you have your program set up, your project set up to do that, in which case all you need is a USB cable. So no more JTAG anymore. We're sending boards out to testers and all they need to do to uh, try different firmwares is to program them over USB cable. It's a make file really that does all the work. So they download um, the firmware in order, and in order to compile it, they, they type make as is commonplace in free and open source projects. Uh, and then in order to uh, uh, flash or program that firmware over to the device, they type make, I think it's flash or something like that. And they have to have the USB cable plugged in. And most of the time it's rather automatic. There might be a couple UDEV rules to add or something like that, but it, it works very straight, straightforward. Um, once we did this, uh, we had a couple testers giving feedback. That's a whole reason that we have a, a, a quality assurance group and testers in the quality assurance group that receives these de devices completely assembled and ready to go in the mail. And uh, they can test different firmwares. One of them came back and said that none uh, of the features of the device were working. It wasn't working. Um, and they switched the device to a different computer where it was working. And they found that the Macintosh operating system, uh, as well as the electrical USB logic of a Macintosh, requires certain resistance in some of the, um, the, C, the C, C1 and C2 uh, contacts of the USB connector require some resistance there. So what he did was he taped some, <laughs> I don't know if you could see that, copper wire 
uh, bridge several contacts from the bottom where you can see the, if you look at the board, you can see the bottom contacts um, have some holes for the USB connector and manage to get it working that way with a Macintosh. A later re hardware revision, we, cre we corrected that, of course. That kind of shows what happens as we send the boards out. Another um, phase in our development, we started refining the logistics. So we wanted to protect against ESD, electrostatic damage. Uh, and then we got these bags. These are just kind of, you know, the storytelling of what happened in our first year of uh, building the first Monero hardware wallet. So I wanted to be complete, showed the bags. At the end of the year, 2017, it was a holiday season and people had time off, some vacation time. So we thought it would be good to have a new generation of hardware and we send out a package. I showed these Signum uh, devices at the, at the beginning. It has nothing to do with Monero, but I thought it would be nice just to challenge people to make their own boards. So this is a raw PCB. And then we sent out a full, uh, Monero hardware wallet um, with a very early firmware revision. This is a Monetsor uh, consumer edition. And there were several other things. Here is a screen, a display, um, a holiday card in Esperanto, <laughs> because that's what Monero in Esperanto means coin, right? It's a <laughs> Esperanto community behind it. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, this is a USB-C adapter for USB-B micro cables, and then just a simple enclosure template, some stickers, things like that. So that was a holiday package for testers. And uh, we can fast forward now to, a bit of time left, I know, uh, to the enclosures, because people are asking, well, what's the next step? If we, we, we're not complete with the hardware, with the firmware, we're still working on that. And a lot of other things, marketing, sales, documentation. We even have a lawyer who's part of that 42 member uh, group. Uh, the lawyer, he helps us with, for example, disclaimers. We've never had any legal attacks or anything, but we, we're very careful to explain people in a legally defensible manner that these are experimental devices. Don't use them for critical applications. Don't sign your documents with them if they're important documents and don't store valuable uh, fu funds on them because it's experimental. And so we have a number of people. Here's another one, a mechanical engineer who kind of scribbled out his rendition of a enclosure, what it might look like, made some notes. This is all in the project management. And another person, this is yet another mechanical engineer, thought that this would be a better type of enclosure. This mechanical engineer, um, what's his name? I think Andres, he refined this in fact, made it look even better. And you can see that his idea is to have a translucent so you can see through this pane of plastic to see through into the PCB, which I like quite a lot because it means that the, the lights, uh, the, the, the LEDs and so on shine through. Um, anyway, so this is one of the options, alternatives of plastic enclosures. We'll probably print this in ABS using injection molding. Uh, here's another idea, which is not ABS plastic. This is a magnesium alloy, a much more advanced uh, process, probably more expensive as well. And this designer thought it would be nice to <laughs> put a color screen in there, <laughs> which we don't have. but. Well, if he likes that, maybe we'll do it someday. Um, I think, so these are PDF slides and that's why these videos don't show up, but there are, I prepared for, I'm prepared for this. So here's, for example, the video that Andres showed made of booting sequence. You can see the one M is lighting up and then the system has booted, everything's ready to go. And so, that's when you get your main screen on, whoops. So this is the, the way he imagines that his enclosure would look and work with the hardware wallet. Um, there's another one that's I think sideways, but I don't think we need to show that. So uh, this is a sideways rendition, it does the same thing. We have some marketing efforts underway. At first I was very hopeful that we would create the design 
we would make the hardware and other, other people would be, get so excited with minimal firmware, they would start creating firmware, host software, do all of the marketing and start to sell uh, these devices with enclosures or maybe without uh, so that we could stay focused on the hardware. <laughs> this has not happened. People are not excited about making money with our hardware. I don't know why. Um, some people have talked about it, but then uh, not any, done anything uh, more with it. So we've got some marketing work underway and a professional photographer has come onto the team and contributed his skills in, in fact, Wien. So, <laughs> right, we've got Austrian representation here. And this is kind of his idea of what uh, the Monitor looks like in its bare PCB uh, manner, sort of mid-development before an enclosure exists. Here's another of his photographs. And this is kind of including the plate that we sent out with the holiday package, a few other things. This is the last one with uh, showing the firmware working at the same time. That's me pushing a button. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we're almost done here. Right. So we finally have a website for the device because we do, we've always had a website for the project. That was a project management. And it shows, for example, which team members are on board, who's a tester, and they can add their comments. People can upload photos and so on. We wanted a very clean uh, kind of product page uh, or website for the device. So we so we got this after a person decided to uh, name the project Castello. Castello, which I think means very strong, kind of castle-like. I've forgotten, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, it's still missing the enclosure, but we do have those designs and um, drafts. And so now we have a website as well, and that may be, all right, that's the last slide. Um, I did want to have, want to show a bit of what ABS plastic looks like. And these are what manufacturers are sending us to convince us to produce our enclosures at their shops. This is a bit difficult, so I recommend if you take this apart that you're very careful because it's difficult to put back together. See that? <laughs> I almost made the mistake. It doesn't matter if you, if, if you get it wrong, but those are uh, both, I believe both ABS um, uh, pro process enclosures and devices. Um, so one is translucent and the other isn't. You can kind of see the difference. And with that, I'm pretty sure we're mostly out of time. So I'll take some questions. I think there's five minutes or so. Is that, or is there? Maybe a little bit more questions. actually. Okay. Questions. No questions. Since you mentioned at the beginning Putonghua, do you have a lot of Chinese members in your team? <laughs> well, we don't, unfortunately. Um, most of our members are spread out. and We don't even have one from China. We have members in Italy, in Sweden, in Ireland, in Germany, in the United States, in Colombia, and what, I'm missing a few places, but in Asia, there's almost none. That means Japan, India, and China are simply not represented by us. In other considerations like the badge, um, we do have some people uh, who work with us on that. Would you like a badge? Because you asked a question. No? Oh, <laughs> just joking. Any other okay. questions? Yes. I think we'll have more questions now, probably. <laughs> Where's the badge? Okay, the question came before you announced that the uh, budget started to win. Uh, are there any other hardware wallets that are open source? Uh, I mean, like open hardware projects. What's the, um, like Ledger and Tezor? Trezor, Trezor is Trezor. open source. That's, and it's the software or the open hardware as well? And uh, um, Well, you know, I, my interpretation is that Trezor is open source hardware. They fail to provide layouts. They fail to do a lot of the things that we open source or that we publish. But they get just far enough because they publish their schematics, for example, that I would say, yes, I wish they were more transparent and published even more. And then I would 
be thrilled and say, yes, perfectly as much open source as we are. Trezor is open source. What I don't like about Ledger is that they you open the package, it says open source hardware, and you can't get the source code for all of the firmware parts that are important that are running on the secure element. You can't get the schematics for some of their designs and no layouts either. You know, it's really difficult to, to defend uh, calling Ledger open source, but they do open source part of their work. So maybe that's better than nothing. You know, the host software is open source, for example. Exactly. And maybe the second question, uh, I understand that you are open for everyone to write the firmware. So I expect that there will be some um, programmers writing also firmware supporting other mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. Um, do you see that as a next step as well, or you're just focusing on Monero? Well, I would encourage anybody here to get on the team if they're interested in firmware, documentation, in helping test, to test, that would mean receiving a free board in the mail. So um, there's a number of ways to help, and I would like to see some, some com competing firmware groups that in some way uh, collaborate as well so that people can run their firmware you know, on mobile platforms uh, and maybe port that to other things. So we do need a lot of help. Um, I'm sorry, firmware and host software are two different things. But we do need help with the, the firmware. Uh, another reason for that is that ST Microelectronics is a maker of the MCUs we're using now. We may be ch switching to micro, uh, uh, to um, micro semi or to some other manufacturer there. Then we'll need firmware uh, changes as well. And so the simple answer to the question, are other people uh, coming on board to help with firmware and make other contributions is yes, and we encourage that a lot. That's one reason I'm here, to welcome everybody to the project. Um, I'll even show how to join. Uh, the thing you need to do is very simple. You go to the Taiga website. Uh, let's see, go all the way to the top. You can't log in until you make it, uh, an account for yourself. You create an account, and one more step, after you have an account on Taiga, you simply click here. Uh, how can I make this bigger? I'm not sure how could, ah, there we go. So then you click on, this project is looking for people, and see that there, contact the project. And that's the only thing you need to do. That comes to me and one other administrator of the project who's in Czech Republic. It's a country I failed to mention. Very important country. And we'll make you uh, part of the project. We'll ask you, what would you like to do? Documentation, uh, firmware engineering, or something else. And after you answer, then we'll make you part of the project. Right, so. So let me prepare a couple of these badges. That's these things here. I can't find the one that I was, that I had the battery in already. So I'll have to prepare a couple with batteries. And then this is what happens when we have a panel and we need to break it apart. So now it's focused. Now I'm gonna break this apart. See that? Now I have two boards. <laughs> That felt good. All right, so uh, this is how we distribute badges and just about everything else, including wallets. In the case of a badge, you get a battery and a disclaimer. <laughs> so you ask the question, there's yours, badge. You ask the question. There's a disclaimer, there's a badge. And can you please uh, take one battery out and give it to him? So I have a question. Um, what is the difference between mouse bites and V cuts? Did anybody kind of think about that? If they have a preference and if they do, why? Do you know what a mouse bite is? You. Exactly, and what is the purpose of a mouse bite? Exactly. So it weakens the port at the point. It weakens the board at the point where you want it to break. That's what you use in panelization. Uh, so uh, you get a badge. 
There's some lanyards as well. I don't... <laughs> okay, and yeah, can you pass that back to him? And he has a battery for you. The last one. So we have time for one last question. Okay, another question. Um, yeah, um, I wanted to ask how you are you um, making sure that uh, the um, secure uh, uh, the security is upheld? Are you using a uh, dedicated secure element, or is the secure element integrated into the MCU you are using? Um, kind of both. Most of the MC. So the question is, I think I don't need to re repeat the question. It's it's all about uh, secure elements, enclaves, hardware security modules, and so on. This is typically the point where we move to the next topic. But um, for example, we, I'll just give a quick show of what the next topics would be. RSA, YubiKey, how they do things, and secure element integration. So in this, we usually have, well, when I do a half or a full day workshop, um, we talk all about these kind of things. And the question is, how do we secure the code running on the microcontroller? How do we secure, for example, uh, uh, sec uh, private keys being stored in memory or something like that? Um, we're using secure elements for that. So if you take a look at, for example, Trezor's imp hardware implementation, they don't have any secure elements, meaning any key that is stored anywhere, it must be encrypted by them or done in software or something like that. You can achieve a very high grade of security by doing it the Trezor way. And I'm sure if you had a Trezor representative here, they would probably defend their case. We prefer having a secure element uh, to do this work for us. Secure elements have features, for example, like uh, you can blow fuses. You can do something like generate a key, a private key in hardware, which means it's not only very fast, but it's not uh, uh, prone to the software vulnerabilities if you're doing your own uh, coding, for example. It's got a few um, uh, benefits. And once you generate the key in hardware, if it's a secure element, Uh, you can blow a fuse in the hardware, little fuses. You can, if you had a microscope, you could see little explosions and smoke in the hardware. And what that does is that it destroys the reading lines, the lines, the copper lines that allow you to read data out of that uh, memory segment. So after that moment that you destroy those lines by blowing a fuse, you can never again inspect the private key. Your private key is not uh, accessible to you, never again. You can't copy that onto a USB token or anything over the internet, send it, stream it, anything. You can't do anything. That, har that um, private key is in the hardware, stored there securely forever. And the question then is, well, if you can't access the private key, how can you uh, generate a public key from that? How can you use your secure uh, private key to sign something? You need the private key, don't you? And the answer to that is the same secure element which generated the private key has other features. It allows you to verify transactions or to sign transactions. So you give it the data and it does all the work for you. It does it internally and never releases the private key to outside the secure element. That's the, one of the... There's no good definition for a secure element, but many of the ones that we've thought of and considered using have this blowing the fuse mechanism, which uh, destroys the, the data lines. And you get a badge. You're the fourth badge winner. I'm sorry I don't have more to give out. I, I, can, I can sell these for half price, but I don't have, <laughs> I can't give out to everybody. So, um, one more quick question. Yes, perhaps I was a bit, I was a bit late in the beginning. Um, so it's a very basic question: What are the what wallets do we support? Can I use it with Bitcoin or Ethereum? I missed this. Uh, so our hardware, uh, it's made to work best with Monero, and oh, um, only with Monero. Okay. that's right. So the name of this this whole presentation is uh, building the first Monero hardware wallet. And it really is a dedicated Monero, uh, dedicated hardware wallet for the Monero uh, community. So it works only with, okay, but people could support other, other things like 
Ethereum or something with your hardware. Because yes, that's right. Um, it all depends on the firmware that you or I or anybody else writes because uh, the, the hardware that we're using, it, it, the specifications are much better and higher rated than most of the contenders. Um, so it basically means that we're more compatible with a lot of different currencies. When uh, you're able to you're able to develop firmware for almost any of these, for example, uh, shift devices, Bitbox, or uh, uh, what's the other one, Key Lock or something, Coin Kite, Trezor Ledger. Um, but you have to be careful with the, the, the hardware. Uh, Ledger, for example, uses a Cortex M0 microcontroller. Um, so it's so weak that if you do any kind of cryptography with it, if you're trying to generate keys or uh, of a certain length, you have to do that in software on the host and then encrypt it and send it over USB, have things on the microcontroller and then send results back. It's, it's a different procedure. What we have is a generic hardware hardware that we make special through the, the firmware design. Um, and we choose the hardware for things like supporting ED25519, which is different than the SEC, what is it? SECP256K1 elliptic curve that Bitcoin and Ethereum uses, for example. When they're signing transactions, they're using an ECDSA algorithm, an elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, which uses a specific curve, a Koblitz curve called SEC peak 256K1. Uh, we do not support that. At the, the Monero uh, community has decided on ED25519, which is as well the, the decision of uh, DJ Bernstein that says it's a safe curve. If you take a look at safe curves, uh, let's see if I find that quickly. Uh, so safe, that didn't work, but it almost did safe Curves, DJ Bernstein, 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 right here it is, safecurves.crypto. It's a very funny name, the URL that he chose there, SEC 256K1. So here is the one that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and almost every other uh, cryptocurrency uses. How can I make this bigger? Doesn't get bigger than that. And I can't make it bigger. Anyway, so DJ Bernstein says that this is not a safe curve. He writes red, uh, false in red next to it. If you look at the 25519 variant of the curve, 25519, you'll find that he thinks this is a good one. You see that? So that's why uh, we're choosing hardware that supports these curves. It's, it's very particularly important with the secure element because you're generating secret keys and they need to support the ECDSA curve that your, your application is using, in our case, ED25519. But other than that, uh, you can do all the, the, that you want in software and you can use this as a YubiKey substitute or anything else. That was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> And with that, okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>